and team back. Hello and welcome ladies and gentlemen to a Beyond the Summit presentation. We're going to be bringing you guys game 3 of Rattlesnake vs. Zenith. That second game was a doozy, but luckily we had a few remakes and a little bit of delay on part of Zenith to uh, move on forward and recover a little bit from that to get on going with this next game here. My oh my, that was well over an hour. I think that was like an hour, 5 to 10 minutes, somewhere in there. And it was an amazing game. Late game, Spectre, monster to behold, and along with that, of course, refreshers, and oh my goodness, just you have to watch it if you haven't seen it. Most definitely. Anyways, uh, now we do see the end result is that we are 1-1 one one in this best of three series here. We're going to see who's going to claim the match to advance on into the semifinals. Right now, the quarterfinal match in the AMD Premier League. And this, just isn't, this is not the only series we have today. We actually have another best of three immediately following. Was pushed back a bit as a result of the fact that these games are just going so darn long and uh, so intense. But anyways, thank you guys so much for tuning in. Uh, happy to be able to cast up this game for you guys here. I am Blaze, joined by Maruna. How are you going? Oh, Alchemist is banned. That was the first thing I saw when I tapped into the game. Metal Snake has played an amazing Alchemist the last two games, and this time Zenith. They don't want to take it anymore. They say, screw it, we ban it. You can have a Nyx, you can have a Magnus. We use one of our two bands to ban that goddamn Alchemist. <laughs> Most definitely. And uh, that is yeah, taken out now. They don't have to worry about that being on the mid lane. Uh, it's interesting now as far as what's available in the pool. A uh, Nyx Assassin isn't as common uh, as far as different pickups are. Same with the Keeper Lights, so probably not looking at anything like that. But we do see the Queen of Pain taken out. We're going to see the Magnus picked up in her stead. Possibly Rattlesnake could be looking at a Templar Assassin, but right now they do have to worry about that Nyx. So Shadow Demon up first pick for Rattlesnake kind of core to their strategy, and I'm curious to see if they're going to go with the Leshrac again, as that was kind of used to great effect in their first two games. Uh, but yeah, they're having to deal with a lot of kind of AoE initiation, uh, big stuns coming out from the Nyx as well, so it's going to be difficult, and the supports are going to be uh, a little bit poor, so you can't pick up an item reliant support, and uh, you're going to have to keep those sentries very, very active if you're going to avoid those terrible initiations. Either way, Rattlesnake, they have plenty of different options on the field, and we'll have to see what kind of team they're going to build up for us today. Maybe they want to pick that Lushrock again, they had that in the first picking phase the last two games and it obviously r works great with the Shadow Demon. Apart from that, the draft seems to be a little bit slower than the last games, mainly because that Alchemist is out and that was Rattlesnake's Joker card. They picked it early because they didn't want it to get banned in the second phase, but now it's out. So they need to think about what they're going to do now because that was their special pick, that was what their strategy was built around. And they picked the Lushrock again, so both teams are still lacking the carry, the main carry, the main damage source, and I see Zenith picking up that lone druid again in the next pick if Rattlesnake doesn't take it. Mm -hmm. That is very, very probable. So we'll see if Rattlesnake wants to kind of go for a little bit of split push up top, and then they could actually force out at least a Juggernaut ban from Zenith uh, for their safe lane. So yeah, in this position, they can either look at picking up the, the Juggernaut for themselves or picking up the lone druid for their split push, in my opinion. I mean, they could also look at the Templar Assassin or Clockwork to go against the Magnus, and they do go with this Clockwork here. I'm curious to see how to play out. We've seen uh, some teams running the Clockwork actually on the mid lane solo, which is not unheard of, but it's definitely, we see him more commonly in a supportive or off lane role. So seeing him there, he's much of a prime, much more so a prime player who can get those big hook shots off early with pretty much guaranteed level six very very quickly either way right now clockwork is on the field and it's going to be a really really strong combo because now when you get the cogs off you can guarantee the split earth without the shadow demon being a part of that so they can really really set things up nicely and i'm sure the next two picks that they're going to go through with will also synergize pretty well but one thing to mention is that the tinker wasn't banned there was a respect ban previously for the tinker and not this time around so that is going to be a very substantial force to be reckoned with and i can't wait to see it and that leaves the board very, very open for carries, and they're, both teams are probably going to ban out some carries now. Rattlesnake is still missing a mid laner. I could see them maybe picking up the Nature's Prophet, but then the laying is going to be a bit different because they need a mid laner right now, and Queen of Pain, they banned it out themselves, and apart from that, they could still pick their Templar Assassin, but Templar Assassin against Tinker, who do you favor? Um. Honestly, it's, it's hard to call. Uh, it depends on how good Tinker is at last hitting. Honestly, sh she's going to have a good advantage for the first few levels, but once that March Machine starts rolling, and if Tinker gets some good rune control from some roaming supports, uh, I honestly think Tinker can be very favorable in that lane. And then as soon as you break out of the lane phase, suddenly he's so much more 
high potential because uh, yes, she has a blink dagger. He has BOTs. She can jump 1,200 units. He can jump a million. Just global presence all across the map. So comparatively speaking, those two, I think TA will win the lane or at least the first half of the laning phase. Uh, but with some good ancient stacking and roaming supports, I think they can make the tinker work. And then from there, it's going to be scary. I have to admit, sometimes when I'm casting, I'm cheating a little bit, and I'm looking at the most commonly picked heroes, and I just realized, where is the Rubik? Rubik is like the most uh, picked hero in the Western scene, if you don't count the bands. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they and don't seem to like we it. We haven't seen it the last two games. I don't know if it was banned in the first game, but I'm pretty sure it wasn't in the second game. Mm -hmm. And it's one of the best supports, especially when there's something like a Magnus around where you mm -hmm. can steal a reverse polarity. But they just seem to prefer other supports. Well, and it's going to be even more interesting, and I know this is just hype around the international that I'm building up, but if those two worlds clash at the international, two different play styles, Asia says we don't need no Wisp, we don't need no Rubik, and then Euro picks it. I'm curious to see how that's going to work, but mm -hmm. so far no Rubik. Well, to be honest, I don't know if I could have handled a Rubik the last game. If the Rubik had like pulled out a ton of fire and picked up a refresher himself, and we would see like double RPs from him or double ravages from him going the other way, I don't even know how I would call that fight. It would just be uh, particles exploding everywhere and just awe-inspiring initiation, counter-initiation going to hunt stop. It would just be too much to handle. So, in a way, I'm okay with the, tinker, the Rubik not being picked up just yet, but, you know, uh, as you mentioned, it does have a lot of potency in a couple different uh, ways. Obviously, it can work in the lanes pretty well as a support, but right now they love their Shadow Demon, and Shadow Demon it kind of plays the same role. Starting off with his first spell is a te the Telekinesis versus the Disruption to set up the other ones. So, in this case, they have their SD, they love their SD, and both times have been prioritizing that over the, the Rubik. Um, as far as bans go, real quick, I definitely saw that Juggernaut coming. Surprised the Lone Druid didn't get uh, taken out along with that Nature's Whoa. Prophet, but we do see the Anti-Mage coming out for Rattlesnake Gaming, which kind of sets them up for a really, really great game. They, they are guaranteed going to be putting out a lot of uh, pressure with his kind of split pushing a little bit from Battle Fury, and although Tinker can deal with that, uh, with the Merge Machines and such, He's going to get popped off really quickly if there's any mana burn at all. He needs a good Ghost Scepter timing to make sure that he won't be just all of his mana burned and turning into this nuclear bomb in the middle of his uh, allies. So that's going to be a big deal, how the AM actually gets farmed up and things along those lines. Now they have need something that can deal as much damage as Anti-Mage. They have Tinker to deal with all the Anti-Mage blinking around as soon as Tinker gets a Hex, but now they need something along the lines of a Void. Or maybe they want to pick the Spectre again because they do need damage to bring down Anti-Mage in late game. Mm -hmm. While Rattlesnake, they still miss that mid lane, and it must be it must be a mid lane that can go up against the Tinker because if Tinker gets a lot of farm early and boots of travel early, you're nowhere safe on the map, and your towers are just gonna get pushed. So they, unless they put something like anti mage plus one mid, they really need a smart pickup for that last for that last mid player. Interesting. Going with a lot of Keens here. We see Clockwork, Tinker, and Gyrocopter all of the same lore-based race. But yeah, the Gyrocopter is going to be adding in some nice stuff alongside the Magnus. He will be saying, okay, reverse polarity, perfect opportunity to get at least half my flat cannon off right there. And the call down will be pretty much guaranteed damage on top of that. So it's going to be very, very powerful. And on top of that, the fact that Gyrocopter dishes out almost entirely AoE-oriented damage with his flak and call down, and the fact that Lashrak and Shadow Demon aren't heroes that prefer to pick up a mechanism or even a pipe later, they're not those kind of carriers in that sense. A gyrocopter is going to be able to lay waste to the enemy supports and the enemy team as a whole, and there's not going to be much to bring them back up. So, with combining that together with a couple of marches in the battlefield, it's going to be Ooh. tough to survive. And although this Shadow Fiend pick can be very, very impressive, uh, it also could be very devastating if what I'm saying is true and they don't really have the ability to withstand all that incidental damage. But there we have that mid lane or that little special pick I was talking about. I wasn't even thinking of Shadow Fiend because we see him so rarely these days. Hmm. And he's one of the big heroes in the Asian scene, of course, has always been. And I think he can he can deal with Tinker. That's sure. going to be a really Ten nice mid lane if they meet up, which is very likely. And now Zenith still should pick up another support hero. They could pick up either that Rubik, which I would really like here, or something along the lines of a Shakiro or whatever they like to play. Of course, it's not only... You don't only pick what you think fits best, but also what your players are most comfortable with. Mm -hmm. Of course, those pro, pro players can play any hero, but they also like have favorite heroes. And 
are known for some heroes. Yeah, like specifically XY is amazing on Tinker. He's definitely going to be picking that up. I mean, we have seen Ice 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 kind of as a backup occasionally running that, but generally speaking, you're going to see XY doing that. Uh, yeah, like you said, probably on the uh, mid lane, but of course there is an option of doing a little bit of jungle action on the Ancients and stacking that up like crazy too. So we'll see how it plays out. But yeah, up against the Shadow Fiend, it's going to be so darn hard to last it. We're going to see the... Uh, f fact that his Necromastery charges continue to just ramp up over and over, Lua is going to have a pretty good time in that situation. Uh, but I love the Jakira pick, honestly. Twin-Headed Dragon, adding in his extra AoE, not only the Macropire on top of the Reverse Polarity, but heading up Ice Paths inside Cogs, which will be, of course, set up by the opposition. Lanham will be trying to drop those down. I could really see an opportunity where Freedom could use the enemy's Cogs and their allies' Reverse Polarity to set up some really, really great usage of his disable and damage output that's in an AoE fashion as well. So once again we see a not so standard lineup coming out from both teams. Who do you favor just out of like personal like for example when I see like a rare hero getting picked I'm always favoring the team a little bit. That's just like natural if you see something like a Pudge picked you're obviously like sure, oh god sure. Pudge I want that team to win. Well, so I'm a little bit favoring Rattlesnake because they also were so impressive in game one obviously and game two they also gave a great fight. So I hope they're gonna show us some more Absolutely. some more good play. Yeah, I, I think it's really cool to see the SF pick him and stuff like that, but in turn the Tinker, uh, honestly, I would love to see this guy more. Like, he puts out so much pressure on the map, XY is picking him up here, and, you know, if, I, I really like some Tinker, like, the Western scene has players like Bulba, who make all, do a lot of work with that, but I'm really curious to see what XY's got. I've heard so much about his Tinker, but every single time I see it, they either ban it or they just don't find a way to make it work in the lineup. So this is actually, uh, just, just saying, this is my first time witnessing XY's Tinker, and I've heard so much that it would be extremely disappointed if it wasn't extremely effective. So putting a lot of pressure on him, but of course, in this third game in the quarterfinals, there's always going to be that pressure. So we'll see exactly how it plays on out. But I have high expectations for Zenith getting to pick up this hero here and also their lineup as a whole. I love the AoE fashion of all of these heroes going up against uh, ra Rattlesnakes, which again, probably won't pick up a very quick mech unless it goes on the clockwork, which it definitely has been in the recent meta shift as far as who is going to be carrying those different items. So, yeah, Lanon will get a mech, but I doubt he'll have time for a pipe, and as such, Zenith's damage is still going to be very, very scary. But like you said, there are fun picks. They have, Rattlesnake has got a strong showing, but it comes down to how much farm is going to come down on that Shadow Fiend and on that Anti-Mage. I'm also curious to see what kind of what kind of Shadow Fiend Lua will play, because Shadow Fiends are... Mm -hmm. You can play them very differently. You can just buy a Blink Dagger and rely on your ulti, or you can go full edgy carry and buy all those edgy carry items, or you can buy a BKB early on, which would be uh, a good idea here. Maybe it's it's a bit difficult, because Gyrocopter has a lot of damage that still goes through. Tinker is annoying and it's gonna hex you all the time and there's of course the reverse polarity that goes through mm -hmm. so we're gonna see Shadow Fiend is a bit special because you never really know what he's gonna do in the end and we see a smoke out from Zenith that's a hundred gold that they just quickly spend on that and let's see if the if it was worth it mm -hmm. if they get something now the one big limitation of Shadow Fiend is he's the not only one of the easier heroes to bring down but he's the one that gets punished sometimes the most for it uh, of course with his new improvement for the passive once he gets his ulti it's a little bit better but otherwise it's really about these necromaster charge always being lost on death and so Pretty much, obviously it's not going to be a big deal now, but if they get a level advantage and kind of set the tone here with this first engagement, uh, it's going to be really, really, really dangerous. Of course, Zenith swooping on through the jungle, and a Rocket Flare going to give them vision of everything going on here. Beautiful Rocket Flare coming out of Lanham, and they actually know exactly what was up in that position. And of course, Luo was in a great position himself, going down, hiding behind the towers. Very, very hard to make anything happen, crack that walnut there. And now they just kind of go back to their respective lanes, knowing that they, the smoke wasn't as effective. But it is support money, and at least for right now, the only thing that's going to cost them is a l timing on the Flying Courier. And they're still going to get that out inevitably. So that was 100 gold spent on nothing, unfortunately. That could be two Clarities or almost two Ironwood Branches. So it's always sad to see a smoke gang early on fail, but you... It's, it's more or less a guess, and now we see... Disruption. Wow. Yeah, starting it off. The Ice Path will follow on through onto Icy only, but there is going to be a lot nice stun coming out on Ice Ice Ice. Unfortunately, it is only three, and uh, they are, although they're out in the open, they're really, really afraid of the Rocket Barrage damage that can be put out by Ice Ice Ice. So, gonna be keeping their distance at least for the moment, but throwing out a couple spells doesn't cost them too much, and they do get some nice damage on top of that gyro. 
and we see neither Tinker nor Shadowfiend meet. Yeah, well there you go. But they're gonna meet on the bottom lane instead. That was not to be expected. Both teams maybe wanted to do something smart because the Tinker versus Shadowfiend was so obvious in the mid. Mm -hmm. And now they're just uh, outsmarting themselves yeah. and the lineup, lineup is still gonna happen bottom. I just realized that Lanham has absolutely no items. He rushed a full bottle and nothing else in between. Like he just literally wanted to, I don't even know what, why he would start off in that fashion. But yeah, he's got the bottle coming along with a Tango. He's gonna be able to pull the lane pretty well, but just an interesting kind of startup build there. Either way, um, yeah, it's really, really interesting that XY was able to go on this offlane position here. See, if you're looking at Western Dota perspective, you see Shadowfiend, or sorry, you see the Anti-Mage, you see the Leshrac and the Shadow Demon. You're gonna think of that as a defensive tri lane, but these guys have gone round and round, back and forth, fought, fought each other a number of times. They know their strategies, they know the meta, and in this situation, they realize this is gonna be an aggressive uh, tri lane to give the Shadowfiend a defensive lane. And while that's good for the Shadowfiend, it's also good for the Tinker because now XY is able to go 1v1 on that bot lane, which is something that you couldn't expect if you didn't realize they were gonna go aggressive. And this is the third game with a try and try. So now both teams kind of know what the enemy does in try and try situations, and now they both maybe can can take something out of that, and maybe can play it a little bit smarter. Mm -hmm. And we see uh, Leshrac going mid. He's gonna look for the rune. Maybe he finds something. Maybe he's just gonna stay around a little bit. Because so far this looks like an insanely passive early game. I don't really know who's gonna be able to kill her, but maybe something with this haste rune. Yeah. Good opportunity there. Unfortunately, Leshrac's only level 1, so it's going to be limited, but going to go for an attempt either way. Oh, the Dyer realized. Yeah, Zenith has a great Observer Ward on the high ground. Unorthodox because it doesn't control the rune necessarily, but it does give them vision of exactly what's coming. And so Kabu, not able to really catch them off guard. Only a few right clicks heading their way, and they're just going to be able to fall back from there. As far as last hits go, they do seem to be doing extremely well, though. Anti-Mage only sitting at 6 right now. Icy kind of falling behind the Gyrocopter, as uh, Ice 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 has been able to find uh, that 10 CS. So... Really, really good for him. Actually, engagement possible, but uh, not just yet. They're just going for back and forth. Sentry wards. The sentry will fall from the for the dyers first. So that means that they do have this block of the spawn. But now comes the damage. There's that rock barrage countering with the disruption. Right clicks will go down on ice. Mana break doing a little bit of work here, but he does pop off the carapace. A lot of damage coming out through. Icy with the blink in a moment, but not oh. fast enough. The ice path connects. Ice, ice, ice with the final first blood kill. And that's a big lockdown for the Anti-Mage. You can't fall behind in this kind of position. Barrage is going to get harder and harder. And although he has one point in the um, Spell Shield, he is actually not even going to TP back to the lane, just blinking a couple of times over to get back into the right position. That was a bit strange play there, because the Anti-Mage used his blink, but he blinked about a uh, like hundred distance. Yeah, he not much. didn't even blink far, so that was a bit weird. And then the Disruption had to be used, and overall not the best way to start a game, but mm -hmm. yeah, it's not too bad, they can still obviously come back and Anti-Mage can still farm well, because they, they don't have to contest that pulling, they just have to live with the fact that there's some pulling going on, but they're still, they still want to contest it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh dear. Seems like there is going to be big damage coming on to the less track there, that he drops down very, very quickly, and as well the Shadow Demon, this tri lane is amazing. Yeah, just checking out the solo lanes a little bit there, trying to keep tabs on them as well, but my goodness, this, this, these combos going in, the Impale perfectly sets up everything that Jakira needs, so they can just deliver the hurt very, very easily, and now these supports are getting over-leveled, comparatively speaking. You look at the levels of level 1 last track, level 2 Shadow Demon, going up against that of a level 3 and a level 4 Jakiro and Nyx Assassin, respectively. On the other lanes, XY doing what he can here, has his bottle forthcoming. Luo gonna pick up some boots here. And uh, right now he is on top of the world. Uh, 28 as far as his CS, 20 and 8 I should say. And then he has 20 Necromastery charges, which is capped out at least for the moment. So in a really, really good spot. I expect him to probably build towards his Requiem at level 6, and then another point in his raises at level 7. But either way, his last hit potential is just uh, uncontested. Really. And Leshrac and Shadow Team were looking for a little game, but they are Unfortunately, he smoked on top of an Observer Ward, or at least got pinged before they smoked, so Magnus is probably going to be very careful now. He shouldn't die here, although he should know they are coming. Mm -hmm. He should know they're yeah, coming. Yeah, <laughs> not About so much. That. We do see that he does get bursted down very, very quickly, and that is going to be the kill on the Yamate. He should have. I mean, in that situation, it's difficult, but yeah, the smoke is enough for it them to close the distance. a lot. I saw um, Jakiro pinging them okay. like crazy because they had that Observer Ward up, but Apparently he was relying a little bit too much on his skewer, but if you set it up perfectly like they did, there is no way out, and now 
they made up a little bit for the fact that they died, and now mm -hmm. they're leaving Anti-Mage alone against the trial lane. Yeah. I don't like the leaving Antimage alone, but they desperately needed that kill. So it's great. One thing that's amazing for them is the fact that he didn't realize and he didn't fall back. Because if they had spent all that time, that extra smoke, not gonna kill, and had been leaving Antimage... Oh, mid. Use reverse polarity. Oh, big commitment here. Lamb taking a lot of hits here. He will bottle between the charges, but it's not enough to keep him alive. Kabu's only level 2. Gonna try to do what he can, maybe with a stun coming. Cancels it twice, but won't be able to connect onto Yamate here. Up on the top, tier 1, taking some hits. But uh, no liquid fire yet, so it won't fall with this wave, most likely with the next. And uh, yeah, still a lot of pressure coming forth. Either way, in this position here, he it, good thing for him to get the solo kill. Jumping up Magnus's experience per minute, he's at 480. Uses the first RP of the day, but to great effect here. And looking at the bottom Ooh, lane, top lane actually TP's in. Lockhart taking a lot of hits here, but he is pretty big. Gonna use the magic stake, the bottle, going in for the ultimate onto ice. Connects here, is able to right click him down uh, with the tower right clicks to help. Uh, unfortunately, the anti-mage's blink is only rank one, so he cannot pursue further to capitalize on it. But uh, that is uh, actually probably pretty good for him because now the invis Magnus is up and kicking, and he's probably gonna look for a skewer attempt. If the gyrocopter can get far enough south, the fact that this Magnus is here could be really, really bad. They're trying to force the blink now. They're trying to force him to blink right over here. Will he take the bait? He's hiding out in the trees. Yeah, he's gonna take the bait. Magnus right on into it's Magnus. Skewer comes on through. Blink on cooldown. Perfect timing. The magic stick not enough. And oh nice my play. goodness. Amazing play. Amazing mind games coming out of Yamate and Ice 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 combined. Yeah, what I was talking about uh, before they started killing each other in the top, we were wondering Tinker versus Shadow Fiend, how is that gonna go? Just look at the CS for a second oh, and then you answer it. Yeah, that is certainly an answer. Uh, yeah, f tr doubling out his last hits and amazing deny counts as well. XY only sitting at level 6 here. Gonna get some kills here with the March Machines. He has gotten up to rank 3, but he is most certainly behind and is gonna have his work cut out for him moving in towards those BOTs. So far unmolested, but it looks like since he's gonna go for the Soul Ring bottle first, that those BOTs will be taking their time. And we see the Chakira hanging around the mid lane. Maybe they wanna go on that clockwork. But they're not quite sure yet. Uh, oh, ice path will come on through. The Can they get the skewer? Oh, they have RP in two seconds, but a nice cogs keep them on out. If he hadn't dropped those cogs, he probably would have been dead there. But uh, using one of his uh, most obvious defensive utilities. And an actually interesting skill build. Check this out. He's running max rocket flare, which isn't all that uncommon. But he's decided to put two points in cogs and not get a single point in battery assault. Now, in my opinion, battery assault is extremely good. Uh, it can interrupt Jakiro's cast animations pretty effectively. And even at rank 1, it doesn't do the, all that much damage. But it certainly has pretty great effects here. But he decides cog is where it's at. Draining out a lot of mana and increasing the duration as far as when you connect them out in and try to go for a kill there. Yeah, you can drop the cogs fairly often, they don't cost that much mana, but they drain so much mana from the Magnus. And at the moment, before he got his arcane boots there, which he has now, he didn't have mana for his reverse polarity. And if he just keeps doing that, keeps dropping those cogs, then the Magnus can't do much, and then he needs to bottle crow. Hmm. Now, so it's not that bad. There was a pick on the tanker, Shadow Demon and Shadow Fiend combined together. They didn't need to use the Rec Room here, they just kind of used the Soul Catcher Disruption, made things happen. So, really, really good maneuvers. And finding another kill on the tanker sets up Shadow Fiend to max out his souls here. He didn't end up going for the Rec Room, but he is level 8, soon will be level 9, and he has all 36 souls from that tanker kill. And with those kills going in favor of Zenith, now they are a little bit like a thousand gold ahead in farm. And they're also getting those levels up on the support, and that's always so important. With those kills, they have boost on Jakiro, for example, because he got an early double kill, and... He can just run a lot faster now. That's It sounds like so little, that little item, but it just does so much, because in the end, you move a lot faster around the map. You can be everywhere, and now he's pulling, so... Jakiro mm -hmm. with a lot of levels means a lot of damage, and then they can really combo that up early. Yeah. I'm wondering, I think he's gonna build uh, Macropire on level 6. You don't always see it because some mm -hmm. some players are like, I rather want to have more in Ice Path and more in Liquid Fire to push those towers, but I see them fighting this. Yeah. I see them fighting early. Now, Cogs in mid lane will connect Lanham, being able to bring down the Magnus. He was trying to skewer out, but just gets locked down a little bit too hard. So good movement for them. Didn't use the hook shot until after. But uh, Ice not being in position to it, for it to connect. Either way, they do get the pick on Magnus. And it's pretty big, but he's going to come right back over this polarity and try to swing it the other direction. Because it'll be full HP, full mana, and uh, honestly, they have that damage to work with. The, like you said, Macropire will be online soon enough. But at least for right now, the Dual Breath and the Ice Path are doing work. So really, really good for them. XY starting on those Ancients with the Soul Ring to work with that there. So he can move in towards those BOTs quickly. 
and uh, in general, they just have some domination. You're talking about importance of mobility and movement speed for these kinds of heroes, and Ice 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 actually picks up a drum, so not only some great balance of uh, attack damage and survivability for him, but some great mobility for his entire team to close the distance and get the pickoffs they're looking for. Uh, whereas, when you compare him to the Anti-Mage and the net worth values, 4,700 versus 1800 on Icy. So he has, I mean, like, I would be talking about what items he's going to go next if that was even feasible with the next few minutes. But right now, he's sitting on Poor Man's Shield, and it's pretty much defining his character. He is the Poor Man's Anti-Mage with that uh, Tranquil Boots and the PMS. So not so great for him right now. Yeah, of course, the as the support died top, they went into roaming and got a kill and everything. They also left their carry alone. Of course they have that Shadow Fiend who is some sort of semi-carry and can be can be played to do a lot of damage, but Anti-Mage still needs some farm because unlike the Shadow Fiend, he doesn't just have a huge damage spell. He relies on his right click and right click relies on items and levels. Mm -hmm. So he really needs to farm and farming against a Tinker isn't that easy when he has maxed out his March of the Machines. Yeah. Not exactly sure why Gyro hasn't chosen to push down this tower. They just put it in deny range, and this, this lane has been abandoned for a while. I guess they're playing on the cautious side and worried about some long-range initiation, maybe land them TPing or something. But no, in this position here, they could have gone for the tower. Instead, Kaibu takes it away. So a bit of a misplay on Zenith as they just don't take the opportunity that was before them, and instead, they lose it. So big, big uh, win for Rattlesnake as they're able to take some gold off the board there. And uh, also some good advantage for Zenith where they take out this ward. Very, very important ward kill here as they, I think, put the sentry on the low ground and they get coverage of this ancient camp. So now they can start stacking and pulling again. Stacked it right here, in fact. So it should be yeah, uh, really, really good for Tinker's farm. X, Y will bounce back. So the team as a whole misses out on some gold for the tower, but they get the gold, at least half of it, as a kind of a down payment there. And then, of course, X, Y will be able to reimburse further with uh, the stacking pulling that he's been active on. And we see a short pause, no real reason giving, but like I said, it's more of a slow early game. Unlike last game, for example, where there are just huge fights going on, but with the try line kind of running off to the middle and leaving the anti-mage alone, there wasn't so much killing potential because anti-mage was smart and just stayed back and rather not get CS than getting killed and giving gold to the enemy. So that was the best decision he could do at, at that point. Now he's just roaming around. He is going for Tranquil Boots, and I'd like to hear your opinion on Tranquil Boots, because in my opinion, if you have them for longer than, let's say, 20 to 30 minutes game time, they just get extremely bad, because mm -hmm. if you get attacked in a team fight, 25 movement speed doesn't get you, get you anywhere, even though you're anti-mage and you can blink, but you still would like to be able to run a little bit. Yeah. In my opinion, uh, the Tranquil Boots are the best boots in the game for the lane and for the jungle. But when it comes down to team fights, they're literally worse. They're worse than brown boots in, in this position. They just they can't get you anywhere. And although he does have some ability, after you blink on in, you need to be able to right click. And by having like essentially a constant slow on you, just because you're broken, it, it's going to be very very difficult to actually make it work. So I, I definitely think he should be looking to change them out eventually. But it's not his priority right now. He has so many other items on his shopping list, and I expect him to probably pick up two core items before even thinking about switching to treads. Oh, they're going on mid. Big damage on Nyx Assassin. Does pop off a Carapace. Might be able to nullify. No, the Demonic Purge still connects. Either way, the damage isn't there. Only two raises and some good Rocket Flare action. And it seems like they are going to be able to get the Nyx Assassin out of there without too much trouble. Even so, him falling back means they can't really defend this tower. Gyrocopter even canceling his TP to continue the split push top because he knows that he can't force the issue. And we have Boots of Treble up in 300 gold on Tinker. And this game is going to... There's like this point in the game where it just switches to mid-game. There is no like time limit when you say early game is over, but if a Tinker gets the boots of travel, you can usually say that early game is over now because you have to deal with split push and counter push and kills everywhere. Exactly. He has a soaring, he has a bottle, so that's the best build. And he's gonna start pushing those towers like he is right now, and Shadow Fiend is going for Shadow Blade. Yep, interesting pickup for the Lothars here. He's going to be able to do a lot of damage here, and if the enemy underestimates him, if they don't have sentries active, which right now Nyx is only carrying one, uh, then uh, honestly Luo can do a, m a ton of damage. 
the way the mechanic works, it's similar to Nature's Prophet, is this cast animation will proceed onto its fullest and keep him in biz during that entire time period, and then he won't be revealed until it's already too late and it's already unleashed. So if he can uh, sneak on in and there isn't a sentry ward active other than what's been used, I mean, they only have wards pretty much to de-ward the Ancients for XY. So if he can go in and sneak on through with an early Shadow Blade and get even two kills off of it, it's generally going to be worth it because after that, even when they start detecting, the stats are still really good. He gets mobility, he gets damage output, and then he just needs a little bit of tank. So kind of following that up with a BKB or something like that would be perfectly reliable as far as a gradual item buildup. And the anti mage is luckily catching up in farm a little bit. Let's look at the network because I'm currently looking at the last hits and that's not very comparable. For example, Tinker has about the same last hits, but he has been farming the fat ancient camp, so he's of course far ahead. Mm -hmm. And he has his boots of travel now, so now we're going to see what he's going to do, if he's going to continue farming a little bit, if he's going to clear those Ancients now. Not so many Ancients there right now, but he's still going to kill them. Yep. So Luo coming in with the Shadow Blade, trying to gank up on this Ancient uh, stack, and uh, right now XY, he doesn't have any reason to stay. He's going to go back to his tower. Maybe Luo can wait it out and hide out in like the trees or something, waiting for a timing, but without any ward vision up on the high ground here, he actually is just going to fall back right underneath the Dire Ward. They ping it out, they know he has a Shadow Blade. So that might be that opportunity missed. If they just always have sentries, always have dust, and are ready to counter-initiate when Luo goes in deep, that's going to be bad for them. Actually see Clockwork Initiation, hook goes on! They're actually going to try to bring somebody down, but it just hit on creeps, actually, so the cogs are nice, but now taking a lot of hits, burned out of mana, and a big right click coming out the way, 240 some odd damage going in towards ice, but not enough to bring him down, of course, and so they just fall back from here, leaving this little ogre, uh, Frost Mage, please kill it, Clockwork. Land him, land him. Oh. No, the ca the camp's worthless now. Game over. But it's just kidding. Uh, going up top, Luo coming in on Ice Ice Ice. This could be big. This is a huge kill. He's going to take the damage to slow here. Ice Ice Ice, it's in over his head. Big damage coming out. He might be able to bring down. No. The Shadow Demon will get the defensive disruption to keep himself up. And with a little bit of ultimate action from the Anti Mage and some right clicks from the SF, they do bring him down with the tower getting the kill and spreading it among the everybody that was participating there. I think Zenith really needs that blink dagger of Magnus because right now they're missing a little bit that that initiation really. They have a clockwork but the rest of the team literally has to run in and a clockwork hook is pretty far and that time you need to run in the clockwork might just get killed by the enemy. So mm -hmm. a blink dagger on Magnus could really, really help them right now. They got a nice nice couple of kills early, but since then not so much has happened on the map. Mm -hmm. They're just farming and farming and farming. So we're back to that to the stereotype of Asian Dota. <laughs> At least for the moment, but I expect aggression to come out pretty soon. I mean, Magnus is only 500 gold away, not even, for his Blink Dagger, and then we have seen Yamate's reverse polarities at work, and I expect uh, a lot of things from that guy there. Uh, along with that, Clockwork, I mean, he's an active hero. He has to make kills uh, work out for them to actually feel like he's accomplishing something long-term. Uh, down on the top lane, actually, we do see that Shadow Blade at work from Gyrocopter. Combining that together with the Nyx's Vendetta, they have a double Assassin Squad, which is so much physical burst damage that Anti-Mage can't hold up. So, sorry for not catching the kill, but, I mean, the one thing about Anti-Mage is he survives through magic damage insanely well, but oh. not so much on the physical. Oh. Clockwork comes on in. The Shadow Blade does pop off, but he's just going to turn around for right-click damage. Call down doing a lot here, but Lanham is outside the car right clicking and he will get the kill on ice 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 before anything else occurs swooping on in magnus would love to get a shockwave off onto lanham but he has already been earned up falling back from here and the rocket flare should scout out everybody participating here just in case something would have happened there was also shadow demon around with a disruption so mm -hmm. clockwork was saved there and they get a kill on the gyrocopter and they know he has a shadow blade so yeah shadow demon also already has sentries in his in his inventory so ready for this no that's gonna be a sentry war all over the map you can already see it in the river mm -hmm. already two dire sentry wards standing yep and it's gonna be back and forth very very frequently you see this tier one tower dropping quickly and it will in the end go to jakiro really good for him to move on forward right now picking up an urn which we've already seen pretty well at work on the clockwork but yeah freedom picking up a great utility item there and a little bit of extra tank for him so next big thing will probably be just more active on Magic Wand and Warding, and then of course Tier 2 boots long term. Uh, but yeah, Luo picks up, bottles up a regen rune, has that Shadow Blade active. And I gotta say, right now, the biggest limitation for Zenith's regression is the fact that Jarcopter is getting so... Not greedy necessarily, but he's very, very aggressive in his playstyle. Ice 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 going on in, two deaths on that top lane that he was just far, much further than he needed to be. He got a kill in the Anti-Mage out of it with the help of the Nyx, and that's great for them. But still, that is death on the Gyrocopter, and he is going to be inevitably your number one. Tinker can do a lot with farm, a lot with farm, but 
he can't do it all. And in this position, they still need that a backbone of the right-click damage to actually make it work. And now Magnus should receive his blink dagger. There it is. Mm -hmm. And he's just going to blink back to base to fill up his health and mana. Then we're going to maybe see something happening. The first big items are starting to get out. Shadow Fiend bought an Ogre Club, so that's most likely going to be a BKB coming out from him. Mm -hmm. And the Anti-Mage is building that Battle Fury, of course. He's just sure. going to need that Perseverance, and then he's good to go, good to farm for the next 40 minutes. Difficult, but it's necessary here. If he can go the Battle Fury and then the Manta, once he get Manta out of the Tinker's laser, he's suddenly going to be a very, very big deal. But until then, of course, he can just shoot out the laser and you're only worrying about the SF's right click, which is substantial, don't get me wrong, uh, as he is pretty much the number one farmer for Rattlesnake. But in the end, you're not always afraid of a Shadow Fiend that's going to be only having two items. And once Shadow Fiend gets five items or something like that, he suddenly is a very, very painful force. If he chooses Lifesteal or Desolate or whatever, he can be a very, very great carry, semi-carry slash carry. But right now, he's only pr mostly providing the aura, and the right clicks are just kind of rebounding on top of that. Either way, Smoke Gank coming down bottom, looking for an opportunity that just isn't there, but at least Ice SSI's capitalizing on this by bringing down the Tier 1, and up on top, the fortification is popped while the... Tinker, who has already farmed up his blink after the travels, is using his march machines inside the trees to scout it out. Uh, Clockwork, of course, can, if he's clairvoyant enough to know exactly the positioning of his opponent, land him can go for Rocket Flare, go for Hook Shots to lock down XY, uh, but has to have the perfect timing and the perfect trajectory right here, and is actually just farming out the creep waves. So, yeah, until they actually accomplish that, XY is going to be safe and sound in the trees, and uh, so they're looking for that next big thing. Force Staff will certainly help as well. But now they will have to do something about bottom because Anti-Mage just ran up the hill and now he's going to see there are at least, at least one heroes there and if there is a gyrocopter so far into the enemy side there's probably more so... But they don't need to TP back, seems like Zenith just wants to fall back. They drop some, some very aggressive wards here which I really much like because it helps them so much with keeping up this aggressive play. But it doesn't seem like they want to get that tower yet. Mm -hmm. Not without the magnus at least. Yeah, they need the mag in the team fight engagements. The, what they need to do is just continually push out with XY, put pressure oh. on the lanes, and then actually take a big what fight. What hook Did you see that? Wow, I actually did not. That's pretty amazing. Wow. So can you break that down for me a little bit? Nice reaction there. So can you break down what happened there a little bit? Um, basically it was the assassin squad Nyx and Gyrocopter running into the tower, impaling the anti-mage and... I thought he was gonna make it because that's why I, I yelled what an amazing hookshot because I thought he was safe because Clockwork just suddenly hooked in from nowhere. That's Clockwork you if you don't keep tabs on where he is, he, he just suddenly flies into your screen and then you're like, Wow, where did he just come from? Mm -hmm. So anti mage unfortunately still goes down but the hook helps and Nick's assassin had to die as well. Yeah. This, it's a very difficult position for the anti-mage to be in, and of course you don't want to trade your life for a Nyx Assassin, but at least they get something out of it. That was a good maneuver by Clock, at least to uh, turn something around. And now they're controlling sentries, making sure that... Because they knew that Shadow Fiend was visible during his Shadow Blade, so they knew that at least sentries were there, and they actually take an Observer on top of that. So they're getting some good map control in their own jungle, which is much needed for anti-mage to ramp up his farm, especially since his Battle Fury is coming very, very quickly. But, yeah, sorry guys, as far as the camera on the kills, it's, it's very difficult to actually keep tabs on the Nyx and Shadow Blade combo. It's just a lot of burst damage and they can be happening anywhere at all. But of course, I I'm actually expecting more action out of Yamate right now playing passively, but I guess it's working out as his team has a substantial advantage. Not so much in experience, but certainly in the gold department, and he's going to go for his next big thing pretty soon. Um, but yeah, a lot of opportunities for Clockwork to screw things over a little bit, jump in with the cogs with the uh, big hookshot. That really, really screws over the Gyrocopter specifically. Of course it does for the Tinker, a good counter pick against him as well. Uh, but the big thing is, if Gyrocopter or Tinker are caught inside Cog's Battery Assault active, and their BKB isn't up, then they're just going to be taking all the damage in the world. It sets up the Split Earth, it sets up at least two raises from the Shadow Fiend, and uh, possibly even that Requiem. So, very, very big amount of aggression. Now we're going to see that kind of at least four-man team fight that I was kind of talking about. Pushing out, farming up Ancients on XY, he can push down the bottom lane a little bit as well. And then once the other lanes are pushed out, they're happy to go in for a big gank, a big pickoff. And uh, right now, just kind of hiding in the jungle, Rocket will just kind of push the wave a little bit. But uh, that gives them the opportunity to just sneak on by here and go back up towards that top lane. Problem is, there is a Sentry Ward here. There is also a, a lot of heroes. All the Korea. 
The choreo! Oh, big oh. vendetta strike to bring oh. it down. One shot it essentially. And I think they're gonna just kill the yeah, this sentry ward here real quick. Now we do see uh attempt for a hookshot, but actually connects onto Lua, who just got barely in front of him. So Lanham can initiate here, instead gets initiated on. Might not even get the cogs off. Where's the four staff to actually get skewered back on into it? The call down the macro player, tons of damage coming out. The clockwork is about to die. How is he alive? And he does fall. There goes the left track, there goes the shadow demon. Boom goes the thunder, and Luo on the run, trying to get the Shadow Blade right click, but instead, just walking away, knowing that he'd probably get RP'd up. Instead, the Blink Initiation comes in, and they copy RP perfectly on top. They drop down, the Sentry Ward still in range, perfect timing from Yamate, and they get the pick off on the SF as well. His souls down to 18. Four lives lost, and the only one that lived was Antimage, who honestly is still so far behind. He's not in a great spot. He was looking for his Perseverance. Luckily, he hadn't bought it yet. But either way, the courier is down, and he's going to have to go Five fetch that himself. Lost. The courier counts as a life, too. The courier is actually, at this stage of the game, worth more gold than a hero. Exactly. So, in the team fight, if you can go for a hero, if you can go for a courier, if you want some gold. And it wouldn't have been that bad position, because they knew that uh, Zenith were around if Clockwork didn't hook his own teammate. Mm. That was really unfortunate, but mistakes do happen, and they really needed, they paid for it. Yeah. Interesting positioning of the courier here as well, but it does deliver out the Black King bar to set up Ice 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 and a mechanism up for the Magnus. So they're in a pretty good position as far as the team fight advantage uh, because they have the, the mechanism and the Clockwork went for a four staff. I was talking about this uh, a decent amount of time during the draft, but I still feel it's extremely relevant here. No mechanism up on Lanham. It means that he might not even be going for one. And the Lashrak and Shadow Demon don't have the farm. Would probably wouldn't even put their money in that direction if they had the farm to get it. So right now, they are so far behind as far as those those team fight healing abilities. And of course the anti-mage, all he wants to do is be left alone. He just wants to farm, leave him alone. But I see. Finding only a few last hits here and there, and right now at 115 CS, anti-mage 25 minutes in, just now completing his battle theory is definitely not that of a big of a threat. Instead, the big threat comes on through here with this Aegis about to be picked up. XY has his day gun, Ice Ice Ice, doing a lot of damage to Roche. They will take this Aegis Immortal, and despite how much information Rattlesnake have about this situation, there's nothing they can do, and now this is like a six versus five. Zenith are perfectly in a position to move on forward, pushing the lanes, and it could really, really be, uh, not necessarily the nail in the coffin, but moving that direction for our Rattlesnakes, unless they pull something, a rabbit out of the hat, honestly. This looks like a... Like a repetition of game one, just in favor of Zenith. If you look at the gold graph, it's just straight going in one direction, which is the direction of the dire. And now they're looking for a kill. Magnus has his blink up, has his RP up, and he's got a fight. on Gyro too. They don't don't have the detection right now to actually bring it down. They just uh, they have a gem on Mark Magnus. Yeah, he has to blink in to actually get in range for the vision though. So if you don't see the SF to blink on him, then you're not gonna blink on him to see the SF. It's kind of a little bit of a catch twenty two there. But either way, they survive at least for the moment, turtling up under the tower. They do have three points in shadow poison, so they can turtle pretty hard. Um, but, yeah, in this position, they're just trying to hold the line. It's very difficult. At least they've waited out Ice Ice Ice's double damage, so they don't have to worry about, like, a, a what, 12 shots in 6 with the flat cannon. But they're still very far behind, and it's going to be difficult. They're forcing out the fortification already. Uh, do you think they can hold this here? I don't see them holding it. They need to be so careful because they don't want to give more kills away. They don't want to have another horrible initiation like they had. So they're just rather gonna fight higher ground because then they have that advantage. And oh, the hook shot. misses. He's uh, not on the point with these, unfortunately. So the, the good thing about Zenith's lineup is usually if you see those like four or five heroes wandering around the map trying to get kills, that usually this team starts to fall behind in terms of farm and the lanes are pushing. But with a Tinker on the map, that's not a problem because if they find a kill, he's there within seconds. Mm -hmm. Because all the lanes are pushed out nicely and he can always TP. And, I don't know, maybe the Chakira wants to buy a Necro book so then he can teleport on those Necro units. That wouldn't even be so far off. He's probably gonna buy a 4 stuff though, because that does more for the, for the team and for himself, but... Necro books are always nice if you have a Tinker. Mm -hmm. I, I completely agree with you, and even the Nyx Assassin could be possibly looking for that if he doesn't w want to blink initiate. If he just wants to let Magnus do the talking there, then he could easily go for a Necronomicon himself, and that would set up BOTs very, very nicely. So they can pretty much go wherever they want, uh, just smoke into a jungle and have Tinker pushing out the lanes, but always at the ready. So oh, top, another hookshot misses. 
tried to hook the gyrocopter, but he was just about. Honestly, what would you accomplish there? Off. You go under tier one. He has a BKB and Aegis and a Shadow Blade. That guy's gonna fuck you up. Like, there's no two ways about that. Either way, down on bottom is the main pickoff that they're looking for. They do just. It looks like just standard stuns. Like they literally just smoke on in. Get the oh vendetta. Uh, right click and then impale. Okay, so that's how that one played out. Back on the mid lane, we do see AM blinking out as quickly as he can, but. He's pretty far from home, so he has to watch himself here. Luckily, Tinker doesn't have anything to mini-stun him out. Doesn't have a Scythe of Ice just yet, but he's well on his way to it as XY keeps on getting that farm. I'm glad he's not ranking the Dagon. I'm glad he's going for actual legitimate uh, build for dominance, and that's going to be Dagon and Scythe of Ice together. How can together. you say leveling up a Dagon is not legit? <laughs> it's fun. It's fun. It's fun. But up against an Anti-Mage who possibly yeah, could bounce back... <laughs> If you think about how much it would kill the Shadow Demon, you just hit him once and then you take him level 5 and mm. he's dead. And then suddenly there's a 4 and 5, there's no Soul Catcher, there's no Disruption, there's no Purge. Mm -hmm. But uh, but I, I agree with you, but seeing seeing Tinker going level 5 Dagon is still fun. Of course, it's it's a, it's very enjoyable, very, very uh, satisfying to just see that big giant laser shoot not out. And yeah, you can keep your magic. He has laser beams, and he certainly will put them to good use. But, uh, of course, with the BKBs coming out, the spell shield's active. It's it's not going to be as effective until later when he picks up the ethereal, and, and BKBs are on a shorter and duration. And he just hiding in the trees. Yeah, and unfortunately he doesn't have a TB scroll. Is he going to make his way all the way to the secret shop? Like, he's going to go, like, side shop, side shop, side shop, or, and try to keep on blinking out. But Ice is stalking him up. Vendetta has a long duration. Magnus can skewer the trees. He can blink out. He can go do whatever they want. There's the skewer. They connect with Ice. They pop off the reverse polarity immediately. Good reaction from Yamate, and they burst him down. Antivate not having a great game. And we already see an Oblivion stuff up on Magnus. So this is really? going to be another double reverse polarity game. Luckily, no Tide Hunter. Mm-hmm. Now, with the mechanism, you were talking about this with the Tide Hunter uh, for the aspect of getting two ultimates off and uh, not really feeling as confident about using the mech and the pipe. I gotta say that's even more true for the Magnus. He has even less of an intellect gain, so comparing those two heroes, it's gonna be difficult for y uh, Yamate to actually get that second RP up when he's 16, anyways, when the level 16 mana cost is as high as it is. So. Uh, he'll be pressured, but for right now, going on in, we do see the hook shot onto Ice Ice Ice. He still has that Aegis active, about to use it because he's just on a lot of damage to land and pops off the BKB on his first life, though. And now here comes Lil for the big right clicks going down. Two more, two right clicks required, only gets one. So Lua won't be able to actually turn it around. Instead, the continuous march, the continuous pressure coming in from XY. Spamming, spamming, spamming. There's even a temp for Rockets before he blinks out. TB's back to base, and he'll be back in a moment. Fully refreshed from the bottle, from the fountain. Ready to push again. Just sieging down this tower, at least for the moment. And Lanham doesn't have the hookshot to punish them. At best, he can force staff somebody into the base. Ice 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 doesn't care. He has a BKB, which is now cool, and he has an Aegis. He just doesn't care. He walks high ground at 30 minutes into the enemy base and just kills the tower. Mm -hmm. And and Drillsnake can't do anything against yeah. it. Impale does come out, but unfortunately not tower. Okay, is it enough? Oh my goodness, they did it! I thought it when the skewer missed that they couldn't actually pick that kill, but instead they bring down the clockwork with a bunch of long-range harassment. Ice has eyes dropping his Aegis, knew it wouldn't be around for much longer. Drops the call down with his death, but here's the big wreck a little bit too early. That would have one-shot Ice 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 just a little bit sooner. Actually almost down, but no, the Shadow Blade will disjoint the damage there. If only they had a sentry, but uh, no. So close, but that Requiem completely whiffing from Luo, timing the Aegis just a slight sliver of time just before he actually resurrected and was susceptible to the damage. So, in the end, they do use the Aegis, but it was going to go down anyways. He literally used it about 10 seconds before it would have expired. So, good usage there. They waste out. They get a kill on the Clockwork. They put a ton of damage into Tier 3, and Zenith now have a ton of map control. Yeah, and Anti-Mage was trying to push bottom a little bit, but you can only push so much against the Tink, and now it's... Now the only difficulty for Zenith is to actually get into the base, because... We've all seen those games where the enemy just has the advantage, has items, but somehow can't get into the base, and if they get a skew out on just one or two heroes and a good reverse polarity, they can really take Rex right now. Mm -hmm. Let's look at the gold, yeah. This gold graph is so different from the one in game, at game two, in game two, but like maybe 1,500 gold difference. Exactly. But this time it's ten times as much. 
That is a very, very bleak perspective looking at Rusnik's chances. This is, of course, game three in these quarterfinals for those that are tuning in in the middle of the game. This means that they won't be able to advance forward to the semis if they don't take this match off of Zenith. Still trying to prove themselves because of the fact that they are one of the more underrated teams, in my opinion, for those to go into the Eastern qualifiers, but proving that they can accomplish a lot here and, uh, Obviously, Zenith just wanting to not only get some good practice in, but show that they have the right to have received that kind of invitation that they did for the International Three. So, in either circumstance, both teams wanting to uh, accomplish this, not only for the profit of the tournament itself, but also for the potential to just prove themselves in the scene and move on forward with their he heads held high. A lot of honor involved in that, but uh, it's looking more and more difficult for... Uh, the entire team of Rattlesnakes. I mean, the BKB is down to 8 seconds now for Luo, and Antimage barely has a Yasha. Like, he has enough cash for that, and that's all. Like, he w isn't going to have the Manta style soon enough, and as a result, there's not that much pressure on Zenith to do anything. The Scythe will be out for the Tanker, and he should have enough gold for the Ghost Scepter before he even has to worry about the Manta style. So he's in a per perfectly fine position. He can keep on spamming away, and soon that Scythe will be oh, an impact. Oh, shot top. Big damage onto Ice. They do get the BKB, so the Carapace won't take effect. Instead, Lanham taking a lot of damage in the Macro Pyre in the right click from Ice, Ice, Ice. Lua will be able to fall back from here, but not so much with the big opportunity for Magnus to go and for the Skewer. Looking for the RP, canceling it out multiple times over, as all they needed to do was just right click him down. I don't have, honestly, any clue what Luo was thinking right there. He was running around in circles, trying to avoid everything, but in the end, he just makes it so they don't have to pop any cooldowns. But he was stuck in between a rock and a hard place, extremely intimidating Magnus, holding his spear high, but in the end, they take him down and they still have reverse polarity. I don't know why Clockwork that was like a great hook shot and his team was on the way. Well, that's what I said. If one hero has an initiation spell, he needs to make sure that his team can follow up. The elemental time. surprise. I don't yeah. know. He was, he was there, his team wasn't, and then he just died, obviously. He got a kill, which was good, but trading yourself to the winning team, I don't know if that's worth it. And right now, Zenith is really yeah. the winning team. There's another hookshot. On creeps, not going to work. Ice path, help. there's a skewer attempt, but he does actually get forced and disrupted defensively, so I think he'll get out. But still, throwing himself in there so hard. <laughs> Man, they don't like that uh, illusion. But either way. They are just at a, a really, really strong spot, and there's really nothing to stop them. They've taken down the melee racks, they're happy with what they've claimed, and uh, right now even the range is taking a lot of hits. So, in this position here, all they're relying on is Icy to just keep on farming away. He's pushed out the lane for a while, but his CS has only bounced back to about 200. You compare that to the Gyrocopter of 260, the Tinker of 184 with Ancients prim primarily. So, the GPM just doesn't add up. He is only sitting at 3.30, and it's going to be limiting as far as his Manta style. 35 minutes, terrible Manta style timing, and now Ice has vision on him, and he's going to be farming this creep camp. Could be terrible. Incoming Tinker, he will be able to blink on into this to try to go for the sheep. He gets the sheep, he gets the Dagon, the burst is there, and they get another pick on this Anti-Mage, who's already so poor, and now it feels like there's no coming back. It feels like there's no coming back right now. Coming on in, Ice with a nice blink, coming out the Impale, locks on top of him. Carapace, there is that RP, locking him down, call down Skewer, everything in the book. To GG. finish this off here, and GG is called. This was just over. There was nothing they could do. The anti mage pick didn't work out at all. Like I just said, he was 0 6. Oh, he didn't goodness. have any impact on the game. It looked like as soon as their alchemist was taken away from them, their little Joker card, they they just felt didn't feel comfortable anymore with playing the game and playing aggressive. And anti mage, Shadow Fiend aren't two heroes which seem to fit their super aggressive playstyle from the first games. And mm -hmm. Unfortunately, they lose to Zenith, although big props out to Rattlesnake for really an amazing yeah. game one, an amazing game two. Yeah, put up a really good fight nevertheless, showing us some cool dynamic strats, and yeah, putting up an amazing battle, especially in that game two. But in the end, it does go to Zenith, and uh, in part, I gotta say, that does come down a bit to the lanes, in my opinion. I was talking about this before, but you generally don't see Anti-Mage, Shadow Demon, and Leshrac putting out much of an impact on a aggressive try lane. The great on a defensive one gets the anti-mage farmed up, they have two great defensive supports. But, as far as kill potential, the anti-mage only adds in a few right clicks, maybe some mana burns. So, in that position, Zenith came out on top with a much more effective try lane versus try lane. They just completely shut down the anti-mage. Uh, GPM comparison, 610 for the gyrocopter, 322 for the anti-mage. He's half a carry right now. And, on top of that, they got XY his solo lane, and he got his BOTs at a reasonable time. 14 15 minutes so it wasn't the best lane versus shadow fiend but then you saw later shadow fiend didn't make enough of an impact he got six assists a couple of good requiems but nothing to write home about and as a result when magnus when the clutch rp started coming through uh from yamate it just kind of sealed the deal there and we kind of have to put this one in the book for zenith they uh
played an amazing game. 37 minutes in, they take game three to win the match here. Yeah, what is there more to say? I think I'm going to give my shoutouts now before I forget. Sure thing. So that's okay. Uh, I'm going to give a shoutout today to Skim and, and Mouse Sports, and I wish them the best of luck in their game in 10 minutes. Cool, cool. And apart from that, have fun casting. I unfortunately need to go now. Mm -hmm. If you guys want to follow me on Twitter, it is at Maruna underscore Dota. I'm going to paste it in the Twitch chat in a second, so you can just click on it. Apart from that, Blaze was very much fun casting, was amazing games, I was really excited. And maybe we can cast some more in the future. Mm -hmm. Sounds good, man. Uh, thank you so much for joining the game, and uh, happy to cast with you.